Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Homeschooling the Hard Subjects webinar. I have John Notgrass here with me today, and we're going to be talking about history. Um, a few things I want to kind of get out of the way before we jump in. Uh, as a reminder of who I am, I am Brooke Post, and I am the owner and the creator of Homeschool Resource Co. I am also the blogger behind The Fervent Mama, which I've been blogging for about eight years now. And uh, it's been a great experience helping homeschool families, which is kind of where I, I got into Homeschool Resource Co. I just enjoy seeing homeschool parents and homeschool families thrive in their homeschool. So um, today we're uh, talking all about history. And uh, there's a few things that I want to share with you before we get started. The first thing is, is um, we are right at the last day of the collection preview. Let's see, I'll put this out there for y'all. So we're right at the last day of the collection preview. It is five products that are usually, uh, you have to pay for them. They're $75 combined, but we're offering that to you for free. Um, today is the last day to grab that. So if you want some freebies, you can click over, it'll bring you over to our website and you can grab those because tomorrow opens the homeschool collection which is about 50 products um, worth almost $1,000 that we give away at 97% off. It'll be $33.99. Um, so we hope that you get in on that. That's um, one of our, we're sponsoring this webinar to kind of kick that off. And uh, I hope it is a good resource for everyone. So I'm going to kind of throw it over to John and let him introduce himself. Let him tell uh, you his story and we'll go from there. Awesome. Thank you, Brooke, for inviting me to be with you. Hey, everybody. Uh, I am John Notgrass. I live in the St. Louis area. My parents are Ray and Charlie Notgrass, uh, who started Notgrass History and after homeschooling me and my siblings. And uh, history was always a big part of our family life and especially in our homeschooling. Both my parents loved history and their parents had passed on that interest in history and geography and culture to them. And so that's been a big part of my life. And when I grew up, I started sharing history stories with homeschool groups and other groups, what I called first person history. Uh, for me, really connecting with individuals in history is a great way to understand some of the bigger topics. You know, when you think about World War II, it's a huge topic, but if you can focus in on one particular person and see their experience, like my grandfather was a World War II veteran. And so he told us stories about his life and his experience in World War II. And I developed a program where I wore his uniform and showed pictures that he took and talked about his experiences during the war. And to me, that really helps personalize a big event that can be hard to wrap your mind around when you focus in on one particular person. And so that's part of my story about how I really love history. Uh, we personally use Notgrass in our homeschool. I love it, my kids love it. Um, I actually have it right here because we're uh, we're finishing up uh, book two of um, this series. And uh, my, like I said, my kids love it. I found Notgrass through um, a YouTube video. I was looking at some homeschool curriculum, trying to figure out what works for us. We do a lot of um, teaching together and then allowing them to complete their own stuff. Um, because like I said, I have five kids, which if you can hear them in the back, they're currently screaming and, and probably fighting back there. But we're just going to let them be. And unless I have to go break up a fight, I told John before we got on that uh, I said, don't come in unless somebody's bleeding. So hopefully we won't have that issue today. But um, just as a reminder, we are both. I'm a homeschool parent. John uh, semi homeschools. We talked about that too, and we'll kind of get into that as well. So if we have a child walk in or if something happens, this is real life, folks. This is live. This is, you know, our, we're in our homes and we're in the trenches with you. So don't worry about that. Uh, one thing I did want to bring up is uh, I put that slide out on the screen. Um, we're going to choose, I think we're going to choose up to three winners of this product. John just spoke about um, how about his grandfather in World War II. This is a video that he put together and um, it's $10 if you buy it from them in their website. But we're going to choose three people who participate in our polls and who participate live in the chat with us um, throughout just random. We're going to do a lucky draw and I'll tell you how that you, how you can claim that. Um, I'll let him, we'll get into um, 
questions that I personally have for John in just a second. But I do want to remind you that on the on your screen somewhere, there should be a chat button. If at any time you have any questions, you can ask them in that chat and we'll go over them with you. And then if you have a question for me or John specifically that you wouldn't like to tell um, in front of everyone, there is a private chat option as well. And you can always reach out to either one of us by email. Um, I am Brooke at homeschoolresourceco.com. And then, John, if you have an email that you'd like to share. Yeah. Help, H-E-L-P at notgrass.com is the best way to get in touch with us. Great. OK, so let's let's kind of get right into it. Um, my first question is, let's talk about history and what makes it so interesting. Yeah, to me, as I said before, it's focusing on people because people who lived in the past David McCullough has talked about how they didn't think, hey, we're living in the past. Isn't it so cool that we're living in the past? For them, for every person who's ever lived, we live in the present. And this, this is what we know. This is our experience. And all of us are building on the experiences and the discoveries and the teaching and the successes and the failures of people who have gone before us. So all of us is a product of that. But then each of us has the opportunity to make choices about what we're going to do with our one life. And so focusing on what individual people has done uh, is just fascinating and inspiring to me. Uh, our family has also spent a lot of time learning about Laura Ingalls Wilder and her family. We over, we've had uh, four generations travel to different of the sites around the country where the Ingalls and Wilder families lived. And so that's been a really neat experience. And then reading the books, you know, my parents read the books to me and now I've read them to my children. And that's just a special part of our family journey. And I also like music and Laura in her books talks, of course, about Pa playing the fiddle and Mary playing the organ and their family singing all sorts of songs together. And she mentions 127 different songs throughout the Little House series. And that's that's just a fascinating snapshot of culture in the 19th century. And back then, you know, they couldn't listen to their iPod or their phone and they didn't even have radio or phonographs. So the only way you could listen to music was to play it yourself or to be somewhere where someone else was playing music live. And that's, it's kind of hard to get our minds around, but that was the only way you could experience music back then, uh, by, is by doing it live. <clears throat> so I'm going to play one song just that is fun that Laura talks about in Little House on the Prairie. It's called The Gumtree Canoe, which was written around 1847. And then John Hartford was an American folk singer and artist, and he recorded the song on his 1984 album which was called Gumtree Canoe. So that's just shows the connections in history. You know, 140 years after the song was written, it was recorded by a modern artist. And so it continues to be part of our culture. So the Gumtree Canoe. On the town Big B River, so bright I was born in a hut made of husk of the tall yellow corn it was there i first met with my julia so true and i rode her about in my gum tree canoe singing row away row over waters so blue like a feather will float in my gum tree canoe with my hands on the banjo and so on the oar I sing to the sound of the river's soft roar While the stars, they look down on my Julia so true And dance in her eyes in my gum tree canoe Singing row away row over water so blue Like a feather will float in my gum tree canoe One night the stream bore us so far away That we couldn't come back, so we thought we'd just stay Oh, we spied a tall ship with a flag of true blue And it took us in tow in my gum tree canoe Singing row away row over water so blue Like a feather will float in my gum tree canoe Singing row away row over water so blue like a feather will float in my gum tree canoe i love that you bring so much fun into your own stories uh -huh. and all like a, through um that's one thing i wanted to mention uh we're doing some polls already and one of the polls that we have open 
ask what the biggest struggle is in teaching homeschool. And it kind of brings me into my next question. But um, this person said, I never liked history and I want it to be fun and not boring. And what you just did is a way to bring fun into homeschooling history. You know, it doesn't have to be all book work and it doesn't have to be um, all workbooks, but you can bring in, like, like you said, music. And that's a great way to show that. So let's talk about um, cause personally I was a kid who hated, uh, history too. I always thought, you know, it was the past. It didn't matter. Of course, now as an adult, I wish I remembered more, paid attention more because as we all know, history likes to repeat itself and, uh, it's important to learn from our past and to know those things. So tell us a little bit more about the things that you do. Um, music was one, but tell us a little bit more about the things that you do to make history fun. Sure. Yeah. There are so many ways to connect with history. You know, you can read a list, you can read a timeline and say, this happened this day, this happened this day. But there are so many other ways to connect with what happened. So maybe you have a child who likes clothing and fashion. You can explore how clothing and fashion has changed over the years. Or if you have a child who likes cooking or art, you can dig into how people have eaten, you know, the types of food. Uh, maybe they like to look at it from an economic perspective, like how different foods have been grown in certain countries and then traded with other countries. Uh, music again, sports. Uh, it's fascinating to look at the history of sports. You know, people have been playing games like soccer or football, depending on where you are in the world, uh, for hundreds of years. You know, there's an ancient game in China called Kuju, which had some similarities to soccer. And just looking at that over time, and then the Greeks and Romans played different ball games and uh, people groups in Central America, the Maya, for example, had different ball games. So just exploring the history of something that you're interested in is a way that you can connect kids uh, with, you know, with what kids are interested in today and you can make connections with what happened in the past and how that has changed over time. And that's the way just to introduce them to the diversity and the fascinating different things you can explore when you dig into history. It's not just government and military stuff. It's all sorts of culture and art and entertainment. All those things are part of history too. Right. One of our um, one of the people answered in the poll about the struggle with teaching history was it's hard to make it interesting. And I think as parents, we forget how much joy we get out of exploring our kids interest. And so when we find their interest and we can explore history through their eyes, like you said, through sports or through cooking or through any of those methods, we can make it fun and interesting for them, which in turn makes it fun and interesting for us because we're enjoying that through their eyes. Right. And the parent, you know, maybe you are a parent who doesn't really like history. So to help you get excited about history, maybe you need to find something that you're interested in to try to spark your imagination, your creativity. And then if the parent, you know, catches the bug, then that'll be more contagious for their kids. If the parent gets excited about history, that can help their children be excited about it too. Absolutely. That that was one of uh, the questions that I actually sent you by email when we were preparing for this was how to what tips we can give parents to help um, engage their their uh, kids. I once said students, but engage their kids in teaching history and, and having fun with it. So one thing while you were singing, I kind of put up that um, that offer for the free copy of Laura's Little Houses. Tell us a little bit more about that before we move on. Sure. So I mentioned our family's interest in Laura Ingalls Wilder. So we've put together a field trip guide to the sites around the U.S. where you can go to visit sites where Laura and her family lived. And it's really neat. There are a lot of dedicated volunteers who work to maintain those sites. And several of them have museums where you can actually see objects from the Ingalls family. And it's just, it's really cool. You know, like I said, our family has been able to visit a lot of those. And so we've put together a field trip guide that you can get for free if you sign up for a free trial of our homeschool history service, which I'll be talking about a little later. I just sign up for a free trial, no credit card required. Then you can request a copy of the Laura Ingalls Wilder field trip guide uh, to the sites around the country to learn more about her, what really happened. You know, her books tell the story, but she changed some things in the books and she changed the chronological order. So just, we have some information about the actual timeline of what happened in her life. So one of um, someone mentioned that they find it hard to find history books that contain how the Lord has blessed our nation. Um, one thing that I did want to mention is um, the Knowledge Keepers bookstore. I don't know if uh, we we had Nikki on with us a few weeks ago for a webinar. 
and she has that Knowledge Keepers bookstore and it is all main, I'm not going to say all, but mainly um, it is true history books that she has put in, they quit being published, she put back into publication. And most of those tell a story of how, um, how faith has shaped um, those people's history and, or the person who she, who they're writing about. Um, so that's a good resource. But I also want to mention, we're going to get into uh, Knotgrass more toward the end of the webinar. But I did want to mention that um, Knotgrass is a very Christian curriculum. It um, it has a lot of, I think at, at the end of each lesson, it has a scripture um, that goes along with the lesson. And then uh, it also has questions and things like that. So Knotgrass is an option and it's very simple and easy to use. Like I said, we use it in our homeschool. It's a personal favorite of mine. It is something that we're going to continue to use throughout our years. Um, like I said, we're going to get into that. I don't want to rush ahead and, and skip over too much about making history fun and things like that. So let's let's kind of dive into history a little bit more. Um, name a history myth and then debunk it for us. <laughs> yeah, this was fun to think about. So if you've seen pictures of Viking helmets, you've probably seen them with horns on them. And, you know, even the Minnesota Vikings football team has horns. But this is more like what helmets in the Viking period from the 800s to the 1000s would have looked like. There's only been one actual Viking helmet that's been discovered, which is interesting. So perhaps Vikings didn't wear helmets a lot in battle. Maybe they just rushed into battle without the helmet and just you know tried to attack people by surprise. Uh, but there has been one helmet that's found that's kind of like this. I use this in my King Alfred program where I talk about his conflict with the Vikings in England in the 800s. So this is more like what the uh, helmets would have been at that time, you know, metal that was riveted together on the top. Sometimes it would have the eye protection and the nose protection. But uh, there's some evidence that Northern European peoples had helmets with horns or wings on them that they used for ceremonial purposes, but it, there's not evidence that they wore them into battle. So that's a history myth that's very common. And apparently that goes back to the 19th century when artists and people designing operas and costumes for operas thought it would be cool to put helmets, uh, put horns on the helmets for their um, costumes, but that wasn't really based on historical accuracy. <laughs> That's very interesting to know. That's something that I personally didn't know. I'm sure a lot of our um, our guests and our listeners didn't know that either. And that's what uh, that's what's so important about history is we we form this kind of opinion about how things have gone over the years from the things that we see, the things that we hear. But uh, it's always fun just to look back and that can be any subject just to look back and say, whoa, well, that wasn't right. You know what I heard or what I thought or the opinion that I formed is not an accurate reflection of what is actually there. You know, the facts. And so that gets into how, you know, how do we know what really happened in the past? And one of the best ways to do that is to go to primary sources. And primary sources is kind of a fancy word for letters, speeches, poems, uh, other documents, but it also includes anything that people made in the past. So it's sculptures, paintings, dishes, you know, just everyday objects, uh, architecture, and just all of the things that people made in the past that give us glimpses into their lives. Now, you can, sometimes primary sources don't communicate the truth because we know that sometimes people are trying to write propaganda or they're trying to make themselves look good and make other people look bad. So we can't take everything at face value from the past. But when we look at primary sources, like a letter, for example, we're, we're getting a glimpse into the life and the thought process of the person who wrote that letter. Or when you're looking at a government speech or when you're looking at a painting, you're, you're getting a glimpse at what was going on at that time period. And that, that's, how, that's a big part of how we learn what happened because you know, until recently, we didn't have video recordings of what happened. So we have to depend on the evidence of eyewitnesses who were there. <clears throat> one, um, one thing that was mentioned in the poll is they struggle with always trying to cover it all each year. So how would you, if you were talking to a parent that was like, I don't know where to start or what to cover each year, or how do I know I'm not missing anything? What, what advice would you give them on where to start, what to cover and what can be done later? Mm -hmm, sure. My, the simplest answer is to say that you're not going to cover everything. So stop worrying about it. <laughs> no matter 
you know, whether you try to cover all of one history in one year or you do a four year cycle or you know, whatever approach you take to history, you're not going to be able to cover everything. And so that's something our family tries to encourage parents. Just calm down. It's going to be OK. To me, the, the most important thing is to give your child tools so that they know how to study history. You know, that can be that's good books, music to listen to, field trips to go on. You know, you give them tools to help them learn about history. And you also inspire them to have a curiosity about history so that, you know, as I grew up, my parents did a great job teaching me, but they couldn't cover everything that ever happened in the world. So, but they gave me a curiosity where I want to keep learning. I want to keep exploring. And so I've continued to do that, to go on field trips with my wife and with our children and because I'm interested and to read books because I'm interested. So that's, you know, there's rather than trying to find the perfect method of teaching history, I feel like it's more important to one, you know, help your kids connect with something that they're really interested in, as we discussed before, and then, you know, use that as a, a jumping off point to dig into other things. And, you know, every topic you study may not be the most exciting thing for your children, but you, you do want to give them a framework, you know, kind of a general chronological overview and a geographical overview, but really you're just, you know, you're building a framework that over time, over their whole lives, they can continue to fill in details and explore mm -hmm. more. So I would say don't don't worry too much about trying to cover everything because it's really impossible. But instead, try to focus on building curiosity and equipping your children with tools for understanding how to learn about history. I think that answer kind of goes towards everything in homeschool that, you know, there are so many things that we try to focus on. I know from my personal journey when I first started homeschooling, we tried to do school at home. And because that's all I knew. I, I went to public school and I thought that's what homeschooling was about and how my homeschool has evolved over the years and how it has become something that matches our family. But how we don't have to cover everything and how there's some things that will come later or how there's some things that we're going to focus on right now because it may be something that's going on in our culture, or maybe world news, or it may be something interesting. Like, for example, um, we if, with the war going on in Ukraine, we can look back over history and to see, you know, I wasn't, I had talked to my husband when it first started going on. And I was like, why is this even happening? You know, like, I don't, cause I was that girl that hated history. You know, I don't, I didn't understand why things were going on. So maybe you want to dive into that, that you know, last year may not have been on the focus, may not have been, you know, on the spectrum of what we're going to teach, but this year it's important. And I, th so I think your answer kind of goes on for everything for homeschool, like focus on what's going on, what's important to you, what matches your family, the interests that you have, and don't so much worry about what we need to know right now, because all of that will come when you give your kids the tools and the excitement about learning and you make, you make it all fun. All of that stuff comes in time. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, give us um, what is one of your favorite historical books outside of curriculum? Like if you were to give a book to a student or to a child or to a parent, what would it be? Sure. One of the most one of the books I've read most often, I I generally don't read books more than once, you know, besides the Bible. <laughs> but uh, generally I, I read it once and I feel like, OK, I got that. But there are a couple books that I have read several times that really impacted me. And these are more for high schoolers or adults because they kind of they capture something about history. And one of those is A Bridge Too Far by a journalist, Cornelius Ryan. Uh, he after World War II, he traveled around the United States and Europe interviewing veterans and civilians, talking to them about their experiences, uh, allied veterans and also German veterans and civilians. Mm -hmm. And A Bridge Too Far is about the ally, attempted Allied invasion of the Netherlands in the fall of 1944, which was a disaster. <clears throat> and so, you know, World War II, we like to celebrate that the Allies won, but, you know, there were some really difficult times and setbacks. And, you know, a lot of soldiers were killed and captured, and it was a really devastating defeat. And so looking at, you know, it's just the book is about just a couple of weeks in 1944, uh, and he again, he interviewed people. And so he has their recollections in the book. And to me, you know, that gets back to all the things I love about history, you know, looking at the stories of individual people, looking at how different trends and events come together. You know, I enjoy learning about military history. You know, it can be scary or discouraging for some people. And, you know, you can certainly dig too much into that, perhaps. But, you know, 
I guess because my grandfather was in World War II, I have a, a personal connection to that and I want to understand what was going on. So that's one book that uh, just really impacted me because it really drills down to what humans are capable of, both in a good way and also in a bad way. And so it's just a fascinating look at what life was like. Another book that I discovered a few years ago is called Bridge to the Sun, and we recommend this in our high school world history curriculum. It was written by a woman from Tennessee who met and married a Japanese diplomat in the 1930s. And he was strongly opposed to Japan attacking the United States. And he worked in Washington, D.C. and was trying behind the scenes to discourage, you know, to dissuade Japanese officials from provoking a war with the United States. And, you know, up to the last minute, he was really working to prevent that. But, you know, he was overruled, of course, by the military leaders. And after Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, <clears throat> Terry and Gwen and their daughter were sent back to Japan where they spent the war. And so the book looks at their experiences in the United States and in Japan as civilians during the war. And again, it just really helps you, in this case, connect with, you know, a lot of the Japanese people were not mad at the United States. They didn't want to attack the United States. Their leaders you know, pulled them into this war and they suffered for it. <clears throat> uh, so that's just another example of how the lives of individual people are affected by the bigger events going on around them. And then uh, something I like to do with my sons is just go to the library and find picture books about a wide variety of subjects. I found that picture books, because they're short, they have to really boil down complex ideas to a simple format. And I found that's a great way just to introduce my sons to lots of people that they may not hear about any other way. And you know, some of those that we've discovered recently, one is called the Singer and the Scientist uh, by Lisa Rose and Isabel mm -hmm. Munoz. And it's about Marian Anderson, who was a black singer in the 1930s and Albert Einstein. And she, she came to perform in New Jersey and Albert Einstein came to her concert. And then after the concert, she was not allowed to stay at the hotel because it was segregated. So Albert Einstein invited her to stay in the guest room at his house and they developed a friendship which blossomed over the next several years. You know, Albert Einstein had to leave Germany because he was Jewish and Marian Anderson faced discrimination because she was black. And so they connected because they both had that experience of prejudice. And so that's, that's a story I had not heard, but I just found this picture book and uh, I found another one is beautiful. It's about a family, well, a girl who survived the atomic bombs in uh, Nagasaki during World War II. And she wrote a book, you know, she spent her life trying to promote peace between Japan and the United States. And just, you know, she lost several family members because of the bombing, but she was still dedicated to peace and reconciliation. Um, we read a book of poetry by Langston Hughes. There's a series called Poetry for Young People, which selects several poems from different poets like Emily Dickinson, or in this case, Langston, Langston Hughes. And I had heard of Langston Hughes we have a couple of his poems in our American history curriculum, but reading several of his poems and learning about his story, uh, he wrote in the early 1900s. Again, you just, you get, you feel like you get to know somebody when you read things that they've written. And so poetry, we read a book about the, the man who invented crayons in the United States in the late 1800s. Another beautiful book is called 14 Cows for America. Uh, after the September 11th attacks, there was a group of Maasai mm -hmm. people in Africa. Their hearts went out to the United States, and in their culture, cows are the most valuable thing that they have, and they wanted to give 14 cows, somehow give them to the United States to express their sympathy and connection. And so an American ambassador went to their village, and they presented the cows to him, and you know, the cows stayed in Africa, but they became a symbol of the friendship that the Maasai people wanted to share with the American people. So there's so many beautiful and amazing stories like that. Uh, so picture books, just going to your library and looking through the picture book section, I found is a great way to find stories that you might not hear about in the news, on, but just finding beautiful stories that uh, capture a moment in time. I saw somebody ask about the book, the Japanese book, uh, it's called Bridge to the Sun, uh, is the one about the woman who married the Japanese diplomat. I'm going to ask you a question and then I have a child screaming. So I'm going to run over and, uh, and get her really quickly. So, um, my question is name some of your favorite historical places to visit. Sure. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. our family, my parents worked really hard when we were homeschooling to, we pinched our pennies and were able to take a lot of trips around the country. And we ate, we ate meals in the car and sometimes we camped or we stayed at cheap hotels to make it really affordable. But, uh, and then my family, since I've gotten married and have my own children, we've continued to do that. And so there are so many fascinating places around the country. It's really hard to narrow it down. Um, visiting presidential sites has been very interesting. The John and Abigail Adams sites in Massachusetts are very interesting. Uh, the Calvin Coolidge sites in Vermont are very interesting. Calvin Coolidge has become uh, someone that I, one of the presidents that I greatly admire, so learning about him. Uh, during the pandemic, I took my boys to Cahokia Mounds in Illinois, which is one of the largest Native American mound sites in the United States. And so we could explore that outside. It's fascinating. And my boys didn't really enjoy climbing up all the stairs to get to the top of the mound, but they were glad that they did once we got up to the top. Uh, the National Churchill Museum in Missouri is also fascinating. Uh, so Winston Churchill came to Fulton, Missouri in after World War II and gave a speech about the Iron Curtain. That's where he first used the phrase Iron Curtain. And <clears throat> so this became a museum dedicated to remembering Winston Churchill. And there was a church from London that had been destroyed during World War II. And people packed up all the stones from the church and brought them to Missouri and reassembled the church in Missouri. It's very, <laughs> it's amazing to think about how they did that. Uh, but so there's a church that was originally in England that is now available for touring in Missouri. Uh, the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art, the Laura Ingalls Wilder sites I mentioned, uh, Pikes Peak in Colorado. I could keep going on and on. There are so many sites. Uh, but one thing that I've discovered is that no matter where you live, there are probably really cool sites in your own backyard that you can visit. So as I said, I live in the St. Louis area. And just in my county, there there's a Native American mound site that I just was driving by and saw a sign, and I took my boys there, and you know just right just a few miles away from my home. And there are a lot of places like that, especially in the eastern part of the United States. Then in the western part of the state, western part of the country, there are more cliff dwellings and you know different types of housing and Native American sites. Uh, also in my county, there's a wonderful veterans museum, and so there you know, are places like that that you may not think about. They may not show up on the top tourist destinations in your area, but if you dig around a little bit, you can usually find really neat places uh, just around just around the corner. And also in my little town, there's a Vietnam Veterans Memorial, which the sign says that it's the first Vietnam Veterans Memorial in the country. I'm not. I haven't been able to verify that, but it was actually put up in 1967. You know, very early in the war, and uh, it's. There's a motorcycle every year. There's a motorcycle tour that of Vietnam vets, and they stop in our town uh, at this memorial. Uh, so that's, you know, especially with gas being so expensive right now, if you can't take really long trips, uh, there are probably, if you dig around, there are lots of really cool trips just close by that you can explore. Absolutely, that's um, that was one of the the questions that I had for you and how to experience history in your town. And I think that like personally in my homeschool, we do a lot of eclectic. We pull from different places and we do things, but I need a curriculum to follow. I am not a very crafty person. I am not a very um, that kind of person that can just pull together things and do my own curriculum. That's not me. But we do like unit studies. So if you find a historical place in your town or if you have something that is of interest to you, um, say you're studying, like you said, uh, a world world war or anything like that, see if there's something in your town that can uh, you can experience that there where you are and then throw a unit study along with it so that you can have those hands on experiences and those field trips and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, In our chat, we have a couple of people that are saying that both of us keep cutting out. Um, let's see, a couple people are experiencing it. Um, on my side, we're not, uh, John, are you having any That's connection? Fine yeah. You sound fine to me. Yeah, I think, um, uh, the chiming that you hear is the chat option. Um, I think you can turn that off somehow. I'm not really sure because I don't, I see a different screen than what you guys see. Um, but I can look into that for next time. Um, as far as the the cutting out, 
Um, I would have to say it's probably due to, let's see, we have a lot of people saying they're not having problems either, but it's probably due to um, your connection, I would have to say. So um, there's not very much we can do about that. All I could say is maybe try to catch the replay and see if it's better since it's not live. Um, the replay wouldn't be live. Um, one thing that I do want to pull in right here is um, we're going to do a lucky draw really quickly. Um, draw from the audience that's already here. Uh, one of these winners is going to win um, that DVD set that I talked about earlier. So Edith Harnish, if you are here with us in the chat right now or, or listening live, um, you've been chosen to receive that free copy that Homeschool Resource Co. is going to purchase for you and have sent to you. If you could give me or send me an email, I'll put the email in the chat saying your name and your email, and I will verify that um, based on the information that you input. And we'll get that sent out to you as soon as I receive your email. Me and John will um, get that sent over to you. So we're, we're going to do at least one more freebie before we end. But there's some more things to go over, so don't worry. Um, let's see what, uh, if you could tell a homeschool parent one thing about teaching history, what would it be? So overall, whether they struggle or not, whether their kids love it or not, um, if you could share one thing specifically about teaching history, what would it be? History is important. Uh, it's important regardless of what your children go on to do after high school, whether they go to college or not, whatever they do in their future life history helps us understand who we are. It helps us understand how we individually got here <clears throat> by looking at our parents, our grandparents, you know, where they immigrated from, what kind of jobs they had, what kind of religious background they had. All of that contributes to who we are as individuals today. So it's important to understand our family history. And then it's also important to understand our, our local area's history and our nation's history and world history too. All of that contributes to understanding how how we can use our lives to honor God and to be a blessing to those around us. You know, like, especially as our country becomes more diverse with more languages being spoken, more people from different ethnic backgrounds and religious backgrounds, having a sense, having an understanding of history helps us understand something about them as we try to get to know them and connect with them and find ways that we can bless them and encourage them in their life journey. Uh, so it's important to understand, you know, to have a basic framework. And then getting back to what I said before, you know, so saying all that, saying that history is important may kind of seem overwhelming, like, oh, no, I'm going to fail my children if I don't cover all this stuff. But that gets back to what I said earlier, that you, know, you need to give them the tools and the curiosity, and that will set them on the right path. So don't worry about trying to cover everything. But I mean, I do think we need we as parents need to recognize that history is important. So we need to make some effort and spend some time on it. But don't feel overwhelmed like you, you have to cover it all before they get out of fourth grade or eighth grade. Or, uh, just give them that framework and that foundation and that'll set them on the right path. Let's um, one thing that we both have kind of mentioned a little bit is teaching history in kind of a hands on perspective and getting um, what your kids are interested in and things like that. But something that was mentioned um, in the poll and in the chat was uh, projects how can we do like science has projects and then you have written and oral projects and ELA and things like that. So what is um, a history project that someone can do? Just if you want to throw out some ideas just to have um, people's creative minds going. Mm -hmm. You know, if your child likes to color, coloring is a great way to, you know, when you look at a picture, you're taking in the details, you're learning information. And then, you know, if it has a caption, so that's a very simple project. <laughs> you, know, you print off a coloring sheet and uh, like our homeschool history service has a lot of free coloring pages that we link to that you can print off. So if you're studying a certain topic, you can print off a coloring page and just something that simple. You know, you don't have to go to the store. You don't have to do a lot of planning, but by coloring, not only does it help your child with their hand-eye coordination, but it just, it helps them process the information in their brain. So maybe they're coloring a picture of a historic artwork or a building or clothing from different time periods. So that's a way just to help them understand something about the past. Then as you have more time and you wanna get more ambitious, you can do crafts and other projects, recipes, models. If your children like to build with Legos, uh, we did an interview with a man from Chicago who does intricate Lego models of historic buildings and even 
whole areas. Like he's done a model of first, first century Jerusalem, um, showing the temple and showing the different types of houses that were in Jerusalem. So, you know, looking at examples like that maybe can inspire your children to do their own research and their own planning mm -hmm. to build a model out of Legos or blocks or styrofoam, whatever other supplies you have available. Um, if again, if your children like clothing, you can find historical uh, patterns and your child could make their own costume, illustrating a different time period or different culture. Uh, there are art projects. You know, you can learn how to play a historic sport, as I'm talking before. So, you know, all of those different factors that go into art and culture and entertainment are ways that you, your, you and your children can experience something of history. And instead of, you know, maybe writing a paper feels overwhelming for your child. So instead of writing a paper, you can shoot a video. You get your phone, your tablet, and mm -hmm. you can make a little video. Uh, Talking about a topic or acting out a topic, you can do a little skit um, is another way to do it. So there are lots of ways. It doesn't have to be just reading a book and writing a paper. There are lots of ways you can learn history. And then I think it is important for children to, to do something with what they're learning, to you know, put it out there to try to demonstrate some of the things that they're learning. But that can take a lot of different forms. Someone um, mentioned in the chat that in their homeschool, they've been studying their family's genealogy and have been constructing a timeline for their family, which includes different events and aspects of history. But it's also brought them all the way back to the 11th uh, century. Right. So that's a great way. Um, that's something I wouldn't have thought about, but that's a great right. way to expand in your homeschool and also learn about your family and learn about history and everything that um, that has gone on in your own family and in your own history personally. So that's a great option. Yeah. Another example it kind of goes along with that. When we were homeschooling, we had a friend in our church who was a physicist. That was his job. And he had actually worked on the Manhattan Project during World War II that developed the atomic bomb. He was you know, one of the many people involved in that. And then he had traveled around the world as a scientist and also as a preacher. And he had collected artifacts and memorabilia from countries around the world. So for once a week, for many weeks, we went to his house and he did a presentation just for our family about a certain country that he had visited. And you know, he was a widower, he was kind of lonely, so it was an opportunity for us to to bless him by giving him company and also give him an opportunity to bless us by telling us stories. So that's another way to really bring history to life. I, I know there are people in your neighborhood or your church or family members who have stories to tell. And, you know, maybe it's from the 1980s, <laughs> which is when I grew up. And so the 1980s seem like ancient history now. You know, my children... You know, like my son was asking my wife if they had cars when she was a little girl or if she had to ride horses. So it's kind of hard for them to get the chronology around sometimes. Uh, but, you know, the 80s are part of history, too. And the 70s, 60s, 50s, all of that is part of history. So talking to people in your community or your church uh, is a great way to to bring history to life by hearing what it was like for different people. And I know those people would love to talk to children about what it was like when they were growing up. And so it's a, it's a win-win for everybody involved. Absolutely. I love, that's one thing that I, I like to talk about a lot is utilizing your community, the people in your community, the things, um, whether it be historical sites or government buildings or the farm down the road or the lady at the grocery store, or, you know, whatever it is, utilize your community for your homeschool. Um, the people like to say that the homeschoolers aren't socialized prove them wrong, show them that you can go out there and utilize your community and have fun with people who are not your family and who are not um, typical people that you may hear from or learn from or hang out with. Um, utilize that community for your own benefit and for your kids and learn about other people and their experiences. And that just brings everything to life and kind of ties it all together. Yeah. So let's talk about... Um, your curriculum a little bit. We've talked about history in general. We've talked about everything that it involves and your um, your particular point of view on history. Uh, I had mentioned um, a little bit about um, my experience with not grass. If I wasn't holding a baby, I had planned to, to grab this. Um, I didn't even realize this is how funny this is. I didn't even realize I had the book sitting here. Uh, I just, when I was talking about it, I was like, Oh, it's sitting here. Cause you know, we're still working through it and I was going to grab it and open it up and show some things. Um, but now I'm holding a baby. So 
I think you, yeah, you're going to pull it up and, and look over a few things, but my personal take on it, um, we love not grass because we were eclectic and we pull in a bunch of different resources from different places and um, options that we use. But I like to do family style teaching. I enjoy um, teaching my kids the same story, hearing their particular take on it, and then using a unit study or a workbook or something like that on their skill level. And that's what not grass allows me to do. And it also has a Christian um, worldview. It's got, like I said, each lesson has a scripture at the end of it. And we learn about these people's lives. It's short lessons. It's easy. It's fun. The workbooks my kids enjoy. Um, so I, I particularly recommend it myself. It, like I said, it is something that we use and we will continue to use. So since I can't get my hands on the book right now, John pulled up a um, a digital copy of, of it. And I'm going to kind of let him take it from here and go over that with you. Sure. So our family has been working in homeschooling publishing for 20 years, and we've built on our own experience, our own background in history, and our experience, my parents' experience developing church curriculum, and pulled all that mm -hmm. together in a format that we've been honored and glad to share with other families. Mm -hmm. So we have curriculum for elementary, which we define as first through fourth grade, and then we have curriculum for fifth to eighth grade, and then curriculum for high school. And each level you know, is more advanced. It uh, has more, more activities, more requirements uh, for the children based on their ages. We do have world history and U.S. history. For elementary right now, we just have U.S. history. But for middle mm -hmm. school and high school, we have uh, world history. So all of our curriculum is broken into lesson, individual lessons. And you read the lesson, and then at the end of the lesson are the specific activities for that day. So it's very easy to follow. You don't have to do any lesson planning. Uh, it's designed so you can do it over the course of one school year if you do one unit per week. And so it's very easy to follow. The layout uh, is very straightforward. So for example, here's a lesson about the Oregon Trail. And we look at one specific family. This is from our elementary, our Star Spangled Story. So we look at one particular family who traveled west on the Oregon Trail in 1843 and have maps, lots of full color photographs and illustrations showing the students what you're learning about. And then at the end of each lesson are some suggested activities and you can pick and choose the ones you want. In our elementary U.S. history, we have uh, record audio recordings of songs and poetry from different periods in American history. In this case, you learn about the, the song and the singing game, Skipped My Lou. And we have instructions for how you can do that. It's a singing game where you do actions along with the, the words. And so we give you instructions for that and have a recording, have a video recording that shows you a demonstration of how to do it. We have optional review material, student workbooks, and lesson reviews, and then tests. You can pick and choose the specific activities that work for your child and your situation. All of our curriculum also recommends literature. In this case, we suggest the book Freedom Crossing, which you're reading over the course of three weeks. Uh, that's a book about the Underground Railroad. And so we tell you when to start and when to finish each of the literature titles. You don't have to read the literature to understand the history lessons, but each of the literature books enhances your understanding of that time period and gives you an extra perspective on what was going on then. So some review questions to talk about, some hands-on activities. You know, you can imagine that you're going on the Oregon Trail, maybe use your bed or the couch as your wagon and your children can act that out or use building blocks to build a wagon train. So each lesson, we just give you a couple ideas of something that your kids can do hands-on. And then once a week, there's a more formal project where we give you all the instructions like a recipe, uh, or a craft or a game to play. In this case, you also mm -hmm. learn about the Mexican War and the gold rush, the California gold rush. And so we have a little craft, an art project related to, you know, imagine you make little, use construction paper to make little flakes of gold in the river. <clears throat> so we give you instructions for an activity like that once a week. So all of our curriculum, you can find examples like that on our website and you can watch a video where one of us will walk through a whole unit and show you all the different components. So for elementary, we have a U.S. geography called Our 50 States, U.S. history called Our Star Spangled Story. Those are each one-year programs. We're working on a world history and world geography for elementary. So those are in development. For middle school, we have a U.S. history called America the Beautiful, world history called From Adam to Us, and then a civics and government course called Uncle Sam and You. 
and each of those have 150 lessons. Our elementary courses are designed to do three or four days a week over the course of the school year. Our middle school and high school, I have 150 lessons over the course of the school year. So it's designed to do five days a week for 30 weeks. And that gives you a little flexibility. If you have a 180 day school year, you don't have to do it every single week uh, and you can still finish it comfortably over the course of a school year. Uh, and then for high school, we have one year of US history, exploring America, a half year of economics, a half year of government, one year of world geography, and one year of world history. And again, you can see sample from all of those and watch the video on our website. Another resource we have is called Homeschool History. And these are optional supplemental links that go along with specific lessons in our curriculum. And you can access these for free uh, through our website. And our curriculum is self-contained. It's designed so you can just do what comes in the curriculum package and you'll get a great course. If your children are really interested in a certain topic, you want to dig deeper, you want to watch a video, you want to find a field trip, we do have some suggestions on our website uh, that you can use um, as you're exploring that. Uh, for example, uh, there's a lesson in world geography about the Gallipoli Peninsula, the Gallipoli campaign during World War I. And if you go to that lesson, we have some coloring pages. We have a really interesting website about a unit, a military unit from Australia and one particular soldier who was involved in the Gallipoli campaign. So we have that linked. Uh, we have some information about NATO and the European Union, you know, which is related to what happened after World War I. Uh, there's the Dover coloring book about World War I, and we have some maps and timelines that are available for subscribers to Homeschool History. So you can access most of these resources for free without an account. We do have some premium content that's available if you subscribe to Homeschool History. And you can also search for other resources. If you're using a different curriculum, for example, you can search for particular topics or time periods um, and find videos, games, websites, field trip destinations. And all. so all of that is available for search on Homeschool History. Just a couple of the things that our family does. My mom, Charlene, publishes a daily blog Monday through Friday. She writes a short encouragement for other moms uh, with a Bible passage and a spiritual thought to encourage you in your journey. My father, Ray, has a podcast called Exploring History, which he, twice a month he looks at different topics. The most recent episode is about the US Navy expedition to navigate a submarine under the North Pole in 1958. And so we have a podcast recording of that. And then we also have links back to homeschool history where you can watch a Navy documentary from 1959, for example, that shows footage from the submarine and the captain of the ship, William Anderson, and talks about the history. And we have a field trip destination. You can, the U.S. Navy Submarine Force Museum in Connecticut is about <laughs> U.S. submarines. And normally the USS Nautilus is there and you can tour it. I had the opportunity to tour that with my family many years ago, which was fascinating. Uh, it's currently being renovated and repaired, but it's supposed to be back there in September and you can visit it in person in Connecticut. So the podcast also has links back to world, to homeschool history with more resources uh, related to that. Hey, John. Yes. Let's, um, you mentioned homeschool history, which is something that I had on my list to bring up that I didn't ask you any questions about. So a couple sure. things for one, um, just kind of go over that. I know you said that it'll go, it'll work along with the curriculum. Is this something that you can use outside of um, the curriculum? So if they don't use knot grass, is there something else that they can use w along with this? Yes. So if you're using knot grass history, you can access our suggested links for not Christ history for free. If you're using another curriculum, you can subscribe to homeschool history. It's $24 a year. We have a couple other options, but then you can do a search for whatever topic goes along with whatever curriculum you're studying or whatever unit study you want to create. And you can search by different regions of the world, like things that are global, things in the United States, Canada, or each continent. You can narrow it down that way. And you can look for things related to culture, daily life, economics, geography, government, military, specific people, science, sports. And so you can search by topic or you can just search by category. And you can look specifically for audio and podcasts or books or field trip destinations, games, printables. That includes coloring pages and blank maps and some other 
content that we've developed that's available for you to download and print, uh, videos and websites. So you can narrow it down by the type of resource, and then you can look for things, depending on the ages of your children, you can find things that are more specifically geared for elementary or middle school or high school. You can bookmark resources. You can just sort and filter it in a lot of different ways uh, to find supplemental resources for whatever topic you're studying or whatever curriculum you're using. And tell us what the cost is um, associated with homeschool history. Yeah, uh, the base subscription is $24 for a year. And can you cover, um, I know they, they can look on the website to see this, but can you cover um, the cost associated with um, not grass if they were to buy the books and things like that? Sure. So our elementary curriculum, uh, our Star Spangled story is $85 for the curriculum package. So that includes all the lessons, the songs and the poems, the workbook and the timeline. You can buy an extra workbook if you have multiple children doing it. Uh, so that's $12, I believe. Um, but the core package is 85 for our 50 states. It's $70. Uh, the middle school curriculum, each of these, uh, the America the Beautiful and From Adam to Us are $110 each for the curriculum package. Again, you can buy extra workbooks. Uncle Sam and You is $100. Our high school full year courses are $110 for the world history, the Exploring America and Exploring World Geography. And then the government economics are uh, $60 each for the, and those are both the half year. And then we have review the quizzes and exams for the high school are separate um, so those are $17 for the year long and $12 for the half year. All right. So um, I talked about how we use the curriculum um, uh, to teach more than one kid. So the way we do that, um, I just kind of wanted to mention, I have a second grader and a fourth grader, and we used our Star Spangled Story. Hey, yeah, I need you to be quiet, baby. Um, my lap is quite full right now, yes. um, but we use, uh, we use it. I teach my second uh, grader and my fourth grader with it. And then we use um, the workbooks. So I just bought one book and then we buy the extra workbook and we use it that way. Um, we did have a question in the chat that says, um, how does homeschoolhistory.com come with the curriculum? Or is there an option to have it um, alongside or is it just the subscription service? So that that's something we just added recently. So on our website, if you go to notgrasshistory.com and choose the homeschool history link at the top, that will just show you the resources that go along with specific lessons in our curriculum. You, If you want access to all of the resources, then you have to subscribe. So that's the difference between the free version and the subscription version. Uh, so the subscription gives you access to all of the search features and all the resources available at homeschoolhistory.com. I saw Deborah also had a question, like if you start our curriculum in high school, will you be missing something? Uh, all of our curriculum is designed to stand alone. So you can pick any of our courses. You don't have to study anything before to understand. Mm -hmm. We assume that, you know, you're coming to it. And this is, you know, we assume that this is the first time you've ever studied this topic. So you don't have to have any background knowledge or information. We just lay it out as you go through the lessons. So you're not missing anything. If you start with our middle school courses or you start with our high school courses, you won't be missing anything because each course is designed to stand alone and provide the information that we are covering on that topic. Um, did we have any other questions about homeschoolhistory.com or not grass as a curriculum before we kind of move on just a little bit more? We're, um, we're coming up on our hour. <laughs> I have a loud one now. We're coming up on our hour. So if we have any questions, that's, um, this is the time to ask if you have questions about not grass history, if you have questions about homeschool history, if you have questions about homeschooling history, whatever your question is, ask them really quickly. And we're going to, um, I'm going to open this back up. Hey, girl. I'm going to open this back up um, to remind everyone that your participation counts because we're about to do a lucky draw again. So um, Edith has already responded to our first lucky draw and she won. Yay. So we're going to do one more. Oh, let's see. And now we have... Um, Miranda, Miranda, if you are in here, if you could send me, you can send it as a private chat. Hey, baby. 
pop down the Facebook? You can send it as a private chat, but the best option is to um, just send us an email or okay, baby, send us an email or if you could um, even go through the, uh, I just lost my train of thought, the help desk on our, um, on our website. You can say that who you were and say that you won and we'll get that sent over to you. I have some chatty patties now. <laughs> but um, so it looks like things are kind of growing slow. Um, John, was there anything else that you wanted to mention before we go further? Well, this has been super fun and I appreciate everybody hopping on and asking questions. Feel free to reach out to us anytime through our website. Mm -hmm. You can call, email, chat with us. Uh, on our website, just go to notgrasshistory.com. We'll be glad to answer any questions. We have answers to lots of frequently asked questions on our website, but if you can't find the answer you're looking for, please reach out. Uh, Danielle, I see you have one more question. Can you use the middle school courses for high school credit? Uh, we we designed our high school courses, you know, to provide the rigor needed for a high school course. You know, we have had some families. Maybe you have a children. You have a student with special needs or other. You know, another situation that would make it better for them to do one of the middle school courses. You can certainly, we trust you as the parent to pick the books that work best for your child. You know, you just have to think about, you know, if they're going to go on to college or do something else after high school, you want to make sure they're prepared with the prerequisites or the credits that they need. Uh, you know, as far as we're concerned, the middle school courses still provide great information for a high school student, but it may not be rigorous enough for what that child needs you know, in college or something else. So you just have to, to look at your particular situation and decide what would work for your student. All right, guys. Well, I want to thank everybody again for coming. And I specifically want to thank John for, uh, for joining us today and taking his time to do this as a reminder. Um, let's see, we'll pull up two quick things. This is the last day to get the homeschool collection preview. That's $75 worth of products for free. You can get that just by clicking that link right there. And then I'm also going to slide one more thing out. Hey, baby. Let me stand up here, Jim. I'm going to slide one more thing out right here. This is, um, you can get three free units to any not grass history curriculum. If you click this, um, this link that I just put up. And you can get the first three units for free when you click that and head over to the website. It just asks you a question. You, I think you have to enter your email and you can get that for free just to test out Notgrass and see how it's going to work for your family. So that's another great option for you. If at any time you can reach out to me um, via the help uh, center on our website or you can reach out to John via the email that he mentioned earlier or through their website. And again, I want to thank John for joining us today. And don't forget... Um, we have a, one more webinar this week, and then we have three webinars next week. But our webinar tomorrow is going to focus on electives with Gina Mayo from Music in Our Homeschool. So thanks, John, again for coming with us, and I enjoy talking with you. Thank you, Brooke. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye.